So uh, we're talking about entrepreneurship in uh, the logistic and transport economics environment. Um, we are going to look at how we can actually contribute to our economy. How can we come back? Uh, looking at uh, the uh, previous, just the past riots and COVID, the pandemic to the economy. So we know that logistics actually is very critical and key to our economy. And we look at the entrepreneurs who, who have, have actually made such significant or such uh, contributions into our economy and how they have actually been impacted because we know that they have actually been impacted. If you look at the riots, they couldn't, uh, I mean, they, we've seen the trucks, how they've been, uh, the trucks, any mode of transportation, how they've been destroyed. And we've seen as well, the, for example, the pandemic, if we were not traveling, for example, businesses were shut down, how they have been affected. And more specifically, if you are an entrepreneur. And we know as, as well that entrepreneurship it has been proven. I think uh, scholarly articles, global research is telling us that entrepreneurship is actually the, the, the economic engine, uh, the driver to stimulating our economic growth. So, but we also know that in our, our country, not just in our country, entrepreneurs are actually um, is on the decline. In South Africa, actually entrepreneurship is on the decline. We've seen the failures. So we need to see, we need to talk about what is the cause? How can we actually revive entrepreneurship? How can we help? And our panelists here, I'm very happy that we have actually an interesting lineup of women who've actually are scholars in, uh, logistics, economic transport, who also are entrepreneurs as well. So we'd like to say as well from the industry, for example, from practice, those who are practicing and those who actually are scholars and those who are also entrepreneurs. So I will not talk much about it because I know we know the dynamics of entrepreneurship and what is the mindset or what is the mindset we'll have to look at what works and why does it not work. So I'd like to introduce our panelists uh, for this panel, uh, this interesting panel right now. So I'll introduce Miss Nolita Ngosi. Uh, Miss Nolita is, uh, you know, a businesswoman. Uh, she's actually the founder and CEO of Unolita. Nolita TSPTY Limited is a hundred percent Black women owned with a level one credentials. She is also in the scholar transport business. Uh, she fell, she says, she tells us that she fell in love, you know, with big, big vehicles at a young age. And so her father, uh, she tells us, had buses and it was a scholar in a, a, a transport business called S. Binkosi Scholar Transport. That's where she got actually inspired and got this passion, passion from. So she, the passion was transferred to her by her father. And so um, the buses, she says, are working under the government and they are used um, to transport scholars uh, to and from school. Um, so today, uh, you know, Nolita, for example, uh, is also, uh, you know, she, she started TS, I think Nolita, uh, as, as with one truck, a driver and a trailer. So she told us that, you know, she just had a big heart. It was a small company, but had a big heart. And so her perseverance and, uh, you know, uh, through the challenges made her grow and won uh, through her hard work and the determination to make it to the top. So she's now 15 years into this business. So her greatest desire is to succeed in everything that she does. Apart of from the, all the challenges and running businesses, she is a mother of three handsome boys, which she tell, told us that she raises on her own. So she's inspired. Uh, she emphasized that she was inspired by Margaret Hedge, the executive director of Hedges Group, we know that is the largest independently owned appliance and electronics relay retail outlet in South Africa. Um, so she uh, she is also in her private space an executive. Uh, she's also um, known as Kokonkwali, apart from the transportation business, who runs a healing school that where she helps young and old people, you know, to release tensions and strengthen body his own immune system. We know how this is important when you actually are running a business and also besides running a business when you are actually a human being uh, today faced with these challenges. So 
I will introduce each speaker as we as as they uh, speak a bit. So for now, I will I will let uh, Nolita tell us a little bit, just five minutes, uh, give us her ideas and, um, for example, her thoughts and questions regarding this um, uh, topic. Over to you, Nolita. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, Thank you as well for this space where we talk about supply chain. I think it's very important that people understand that uh, as women, if there's one thing that I can say is that it's very important that we become prepared. We are prepared in so that when these opportunities open up, we are ready and we can take up space. Um, when I started Nolita TS, um, I started in 20. 16 and one of the things that was happening was that I've, I, I was already within the transport uh, uh, sector and I was already um, you know have done so much in terms of, of the buses but um, to dive into trucking for me it was very um, challenging because you know transport is transport and sometimes you think oh well uh, you know, if you know how to ride a bike, you know, anytime the bike is available, you'll be able to jump in. Little did I know that this is actually not, not a bike, but it's actually a, a motorcycle. <laughs> and uh, I needed new skills um, to understand the industry, but also to, to, to know what needs to be done because tracking came uh, very, it's very different to, 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 to buses. But when you are prepared and when you are open to learn, then you'll be able to make it. When you have an open mind to say, you know what, I know nothing. And I still say today, I still know nothing because I'm still learning. If I'm open and say, I know nothing, then I'm opening myself to learn, to learn from everyone, to learn from whoever is willing to teach me. I'm still learning. Um, I started in 2016 and I raised my hand. Um, I was working as a full-time employ employee at that time in the company and they were looking for um, black female suppliers because we know the industry in the trucking industry, it's always um, uh, uh, dominated by, by males. That's the first thing. And, and the second thing within that particular company that I was working for at that time, it was also uh, Caucasian males that was dominating. So they were looking for females, more percentage in terms of uh, the BE score. And, um, you know, I raised my hand and, I, and I, I did say that if you guys are willing to teach me, I'm willing to come in as a subcontractor, but you must hold my hand the whole time because I know nothing about, about tracking. I know buses, but I know nothing about tracking. And that's how I actually started. The, uh, um, I had to raise money to, to be able to purchase my truck. I bought the truck, uh, Rana Scania's, you know, and um, 460 and I started using a tanker just so that I could get into the feel of the business so that I could start transporting with my driver I had a very dedicated driver um, and I was his um, driver assistant and um, we just started running so that you know sometimes when, when opportunities come, the most important thing that you need to do is just to jump in, dive in and just do it. Because when you wait to be ready, to be registered and to, you know for other things, sometimes those things can delay. And because my business formally was registered in 2016 and, 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 and in 2017, we started in 2016, but we formally registered everything in 2017. But and as I'm saying to you guys and to all the entrepreneurs and, and to everyone out there is that when you are ready, just start, you know, sometimes there are certain documents that you may not have. Sometimes there are certain things that you may not have at that time. But when you start, you build yourself as you go along. You get the, 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 the necessary documents as you go get along, as you go along. You, you get the necessary skills. You get the necessary um. Uh, uh, things that you need. So we, we were formally registered in 2017 and we just 
you know, we just kept on going. We've never looked back. It's been hard. Um, it's it's not a smooth sailing uh, uh, industry and especially for women. But all I want to say out there is that if, if you're a woman and you want to get into a space that is, you know, a, a male dominated, I think when you are prepared mentally, you need to be prepared so that you, you, you are able to face in those challenges. But at the same time, you know, if, if you if, if you hear of any opportunity, raise your hand. I mean, I was an employee. I was I was pretty much very comfortable in my job at that time. Um, but I raised my hand to say, you know what? Here's an opportunity for Black females. I'm able. I've got some kind of an experience in transporting, but I'm able to say, yes, I'm available. I can do this, pick me, let me try. And I think the preparedness for women, the preparedness to just do it, is the key. Thank you. Uh, Spongile, I think you are muted, please. <laughs> Un unmute yourself. Thank Good. you, uh, Nolita. Thank, Thank you, you very much for that inspiring and, and background in terms of how you started. I'm sure we are all inspired and uh, potential or in, uh, in, uh, entrepreneurs are also looking forward actually to engage further with you and the lessons that you'll continue to share with us. So let me introduce uh, Miss Onika uh, Mailula, who is our, our next panelist. Uh, uh, who, let me just introduce her. Ms. Onika Mairula is a supply chain director at uh, Kerry, Sub-Saharan Africa. She has worked across various manufacturing industries, managing end-to-end -end supply chains focused on coordinated uh, you know, organization effort. And uh, she is very passionate about building teams and nurturing talent. She has she also has an interest in digital transformation, which is a topic that we have actually seen being raised from the audience as well, uh, to enable uh, easy access of information, collaboration, informed decision-making, and also supply chain performance management. We know that actually, you know, uh, this is very important currently right now looking at the pandemic. Uh, she also holds, Onika also holds a, mas a, a, a master's in, in, in supply chain. She holds a, uh, a BCom honors in, logis in logistics. So she started as an industrial engineer. Um, we've called her here because actually I know that she, when she actually ventured in transport economics or logistics, uh, she was actually telling me back then in those days about, you know, how this sector has actually been, uh, is a sector that has a lot of potential, but you know, there are not many people who are studying it, but she eventually ended up in the supply chain. So she will tell us more about her thoughts about this topic and about what she thinks. Onika, over to you. Thank you very much, Swongile. Am I audible enough? Yes, you are. All right. My name is Onika, and uh, today I just want to bring a perspective to the aspiring entrepreneurs and the entrepreneurs here of how we see the need in, in corporate, because right now I'm based in corporate. So I just want you to indulge me for five minutes. What we have seen since the disruption that, were brought, that was brought on by the COVID uh, pandemic last year, and recently in KZ and the unrest is that we, we, we made a mistake of trying to return everything back to normal, to where it was, to say, okay, this is how, how, how long we have been delivering, this is where we've been storing our product. And we have realized that that was a big mistake we need to start looking at things differently. And one of the precursors to this is that we realized that when people were locked away in their homes during the hard lockdown and people started transacting online more often, they started, when they came back into the office or when they came back to work, they started 
expecting the same experience that they are getting from your take a lot, your Amazons, your uh, whoever is selling online, and they started expecting it in the professional or so-called professional environment. But then what does it mean to the logistics uh, professional or to the entrepreneur? The solutions, so my, what I'm urging today is that the solutions that we are putting on the table needs to evolve as well from your normal, you take a pallet, you put it on the truck and then it gets to the customer, it gets offloaded. There is now a greater need for information to be given to the customers real time. So when a customer places an order, we must think of it as, imagine if it's you who's placing just a normal order in your household. Customers want information. They want it, it must be accurate and it must be instantaneous. People are working, are no longer working your traditional nine to five. Therefore, we see buyers in organizations or people working that are online at like 11 o'clock and they need a quick update on their loads that uh, are on the road. But when we are dealing with, when we are fostering entrepreneurs, we find that for us to be able to give that service, we need to make a hundred calls, wake people up. They, that information is not available readily. So the first challenge that I'm going to ask for budding entrepreneurs is over and above the traditional trucks on the road that we are putting out there. What apps can we bring into the market? to make sure that we are able to give people information. Over and above that, we know that when we talk apps and we talk entrepreneurship, it's like, no, it's not gelling together because there's capital investment and all that, which brings me to my next point. My next point is about collaboration. What the disruption has also shown us is that we are unable to rely on individual businesses. So we are unable to rely on one company offering us service because things happen. There, is, there are instances where trucks were in KZN and then the arrest happened, the unrest happened, the rioting happened, and we couldn't get the trucks back to Joburg or the trucks were destroyed with products on. And what happened was that we saw a rise in collaboration amongst smaller companies uh, when they started working together to make sure that they collaborate, they share laws together, they share information. So what I'd like to leave this audience with is two things. When we are thinking transportation and logistics, and we're thinking about the future, let us look for ways where we can integrate technology to make sure that the information is available on time for everyone, regardless of the size of the organization that's providing service. And also we need to go, there's enough work for all of us. We now need to start going into collaborative relationship. What collaborative relationship does for us is that, for example, Kerry is in different environment. Different customers who receive product from different suppliers. Can you imagine the kind in South Africa where we are cooperating with each other? So those are my thoughts. I, I would like people to think more about it and give us ideas on how we can push that forward. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, Spoiler, you are not audible again. No, we still can't hear you. It seems that you're not on mute, but we still can't um, hear you. Perhaps there's something you. wrong with the speaker. Can you not hear me? Okay. Yes, perfect. Now. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, thank you, Onika. I think that's very, I think you're touching on the very most important um, aspect that has been spoken about, or I think many of us as Black entrepreneurs or as Black businesses, even as individuals we battle with, and, um, that's collaboration. And I hear you say that you've seen that during uh, these riots that you, you have seen smaller um, you know, companies coming together and trying to resolve this. And I think that's a very important point that perhaps we'll touch on um, quickly as we, we get questions and as I ask each of one of you uh, in terms of what you think. So the next speaker is uh, Ms. Lebohang Litswalo, 
I think she's known in the industry as uh, the chief executive of Sigpoint and uh, the founder of um, AWISCA, which is African Women in Supply Chain, um, uh, Supply Chain Association. So Lebu is, uh, you know, manages the organization that uh, it provides uh, sustainable supply chain uh, advisory, logistics and capacity development solutions. Um, you know, she's a thought leader in advocating on all portfolios of supply chain uh, from procurement logistics, influencing positive uh, change in supply chain within organizations. So her depth of wisdom and knowledge about social political issues has given her key, uh, seen her give key addresses in different forums on radio and print and media. Last week, I think we've, uh, we, we were witnessing that uh, during her, uh, the summit, Women, Women in Leadership Summit on Supply Chain Management. Uh, she has been recognized and has received various awards. Uh, in 2008, she was profiled on the Financial Mail she has been nominated on Global Business Leadership Award for Business Leadership Award in 2017. And recently in 2019, if you all recall, she was recognized as one of the 100 global most influential women in supply chain. So Lebu, uh, without much ado, may you please uh, say uh, your share, share your ideas, your experience with the audience. All right, thank you so much, um, Sibongile, and good morning, ladies. Um, it's always so exciting to be part of these platforms because it's really around us as women in supply chain, talking about leadership and how we advocate procurement and all the way to logistics. And yes, it's still Women's Month. I'm very excited. You only have got um, how many months? Uh, two days um, to go before we, we go into September. So let's celebrate ourselves as women in supply chain. And for me, this is one of the crucial conversations, um, Sibongile. Um, that we should have um, amongst us as women in the industry in supply chain as to how we elevate um, supply chain and how do we ensure that we fully participate and add in some value in the economy. Yes, our topic is really around um, entrepreneurship in the um, you know, logistics sector, which is already part of supply chain. I just want to give you the facts, um, colleagues, um, from, from the industry perspective. Start thinking around transportation as to how it contributes um, to um, the industry. Um, close to 10%, depending on a year-to-year -year basis, 10% of the economic sector, it's um, the transport sector, how we contribute to the GDP. And that means transportation from various modes of transport, by the way, road, rail, maritime, Time, look at aviation, clearing and forwarding as well, fully, fully contributing to the transport sector. But um, I, I remember in 2018, 2019, um, transport sector um, contributed 319 billion. Um, ladies, I want you to remember that number, 319 billion um, between 2018, 2019 um, financial year into the sector, into the GDP of our country. Um, but what does that mean? Um, within that 319 billion, um, we only have few women that are participating in transport. So the transport sector already has got less than 5% of women, by the way, less than 5% that are getting opportunities within that 319 billion. So that is not a good picture. Um, I also want to really um, flag that the industry obviously is already challenged. We know the transport sector is highly male dominated, but that does not stop us because there's a lot of capacitation that is created in that regard. Um, I want to also bring another perspective, um, Sibongila, around um, in terms of the national development plan. Um, in one of the chapters of the national development plan, it indicates that um, transport um, as one of the key economic levers. So it means it's already a foundation of all the economic sectors in the industry. If you are in mining, which is one of the economic sector, we need transportation to move. You are already in manufacturing, you need um, transportation. You are in construction, which is one of the key economic sectors, you need transportation. So transportation is the foundation of each and every economic activity without logistics, without specifically focusing on transportation, we cannot um, continue from the economic perspective. So now looking at the industry, I'm trying to create a context in terms of the industry perspective, but also look at women participation in the transport sector in terms of the dynamics. Like I said, 
less than 5% of women are or really operating and getting opportunities around it. So what does that really mean for us ladies? Um, and, and I'll tell you a bit of the work that we are doing. As a supply chain coach in the industry, we've been doing a lot of mentoring. Um, our organization, which is Singpoint, we do end-to-end -end supply chain advisory. However, part of what we are doing is running mentorship programs for women in the transport. We just finished a, a program right now with UN Women and Tita, where now we have really, um, what do I call it? We have a um, mentor and coached uh, close to 250 women since last year in the transport sector. Some of them are in maritime. They are seeking opportunities around that. Some of them are in road freight. Some of them are in passenger transport. Some of them are running their clearing and forth. So we have built their technical capabilities to be able to operate and really start transforming the industry. Um, I was told when we started with the program um, that we will never do it. Women cannot make it in this industry. But we have shown that if you start building the technical capabilities of women, then they can participate within the industry because the opportunities are there. So now I want to now talk about the opportunities now around South Africa and Africa as a whole. Most of you probably have really heard around the Africa Free Continental Trade Area, which is really, really, really the game changer of Africa as a whole. From procurement, um, most of us being procurement specialists, we already know our reliance on Asian countries, on European countries, and how much we are not doing beneficiation um, in, in, in South Africa and also in Africa, whilst we have so many resources as well. So through Africa Free Continental Trade Area, we're trying to change the perspective of yourself as a procurement specialist and transporter as well out there. How do we want to change that? We're looking at intra-trade, we want to look at localization, we want to look at industrialization as well. It means now we need to start beneficiating. And if you're a procurement person, it means being able to procure locally buying locally, we know what we are driving from the procurement perspective. But from the transport perspective, what does it mean for us as entrepreneurs out there? We are in logistics, we want to make sure that most of us as women are participating with it. It means now starting to now position ourselves within the Africa Free Continental Trade Area landscape, seeking opportunities around that because as we start beneficiating and we produce in Africa, it means that opportunities exist. But also the one important part, which I didn't say around after, um, is that after strive to push women, look at women empowerment, ensuring that women in the rural areas, ensuring that women participate, they are able to obtain opportunities within after itself, as we beneficiate, as we industrialize, it means as well as that women can also participate in those opportunities. So colleagues, that is the landscape. We cannot really sit back and say that logistics is male dominated. I'm putting it out there to say that we can build those technical capabilities. It has been done. And, and besides what we are doing, there's also youth that we are working with. Um, I love what our previous speaker was talking about around collaborating. Part of the collaboration as well is for us working with the universities from the AWISCA African Women in Supply Chain Association is an NGO, nonprofit as it is, but we're always seeking to get mentors and coaches in the industry to be able to change the landscape of supply chain. So after really means a lot as we build the youth, we pipelining the youth to have those entrepreneurial and um, um, what is it, workplace readiness programs, but from the entrepreneurship perspective, we want to build that capacity around transportation so that we have these young ones already being elevated within the transport sector. But also, we want to see women also make a difference. The women professionals start remembering that when you are in the organization and you have this landscape of enterprise and supply development program, start remembering that we have those women in the industry that can do the work. But also start thinking as an entrepreneur that the opportunities are there, but you also be challenged around it. But let me tell you this, the exciting part is that we've already planted the seed. And as we have planted the seed, it means that high participation of all of us as women, it's there. It means that we do not have any excuses. So Sibongile, just bring you also that I've given the perspective from the coaching perspective, from the industry landscape and the women participation that yes, it is still there the challenge, but let me tell you, 
opportunities are, are around there and technology as well. I'm not going to talk much about technology. Technology has brought it and made it easier for us as women to be able to participate in the transport sector, being able to seek opportunities and making a success out of it. So let's do it, ladies. Thank you. Thank you, Lebu. Thank you very much for those insights and, and sharing that, um, you know, it is there, it's doable. And I think that will help, I think, a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of women who actually are afraid of this industry and its challenges and, you know, where there's male dominance, um, how women are treated. But you are telling us that it is doable. It's been done. So we're looking forward to, I think, as we post the summit to see how we can actually get women together who are actually struggling in this space because there are quite a few that have reached out actually to tell us how that's why we've put this as as, as, as a topic so i think um i will take I will, i'll talk to questions from the, the from the audience as well as tweak them with some of those that I've had. So um, Nolita, I think your story is uh, touches a lot of um, people here in the audience and a lot of those that aren't here in terms of courage, in terms of how you did that. So we have a, 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 a question there from the audience, which, um, I, which he says that, uh, you know, your journey is actually inspiring, but she wants to know how did you, how did you actually deal with the challenges, um, you know, that you came across in, in, in your business? Um, uh, one of the audience is asking that question. Okay. Challenges will always be there. Challenges are part of life, but it's how you overcome them as you fall, as you rise, it's how you overcome them. So the first challenge that she asked me was, how did I raise the funds to actually purchase the, 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 the truck? So the first thing, uh, you, you guys do remember that I did say that I was a full-time employee at that time. So I, I, I de dealt with a lot of loans at the time. Uh, and after leaving my employment, I took the money that I got uh, to actually put it together to actually purchase the, the truck. So I took a lot of loans uh, to actually do that, um, to purchase the truck so that the truck becomes, uh, I don't have a liability of paying for the truck on a monthly, month to month basis, but I actually bought it cash. And um, it, it was very hard, I must tell you, I borrowed so much money from everyone. I borrowed uh, some money from my mom, I borrowed some money from my sister, and just so that I could get the truck. And I got the, the trailer from the company that I was working with and um they borrowed me the trailer I was it was on lease and eventually over the following year I managed to buy the trailer from the company um, in the following year which was 2017 I was able to purchase my second truck and to purchase also a another trailer so I had a tanker and a uh, trailer so everything that I made as a company, I took it back into the company so that I could grow the company, um, you know, slowly but surely. I purchased the two tankers, the, the two trailers, and I purchased the, the, the second um, truck. Unfortunately, as we know, COVID hit in 2020. Uh, 20 last year, uh, my company went through quite a lot of strain because of the, uh, you know, the you know, I was working with, with um, the mines and the mines were closed and a lot of industrial companies were closed due to the shutdown and to the lockdown. And um, unfortunately it, it took a knock. So I had to make a sacrifice of selling one of my trucks and one of the uh, tankers. So sometimes you do need to take certain steps back as an entrepreneur and you shouldn't be scared. You know, it was scary at the time because um, I am divorcing and um, I had to move houses. I had to make a choice uh, at the same time to say, um, you know, do I, do I stay in the comfort of a certain house or do I downgrade my household? So as an entrepreneur, those are some of the challenges that you become faced with. So I had to downgrade, you know, from a big house to a smaller house. I had to downgrade from a big car to a smaller car. But you take those, um, those you know, those challenges and you 
you will fall. I mean, it's part of entrepreneurship. You will fall, you will fail, you will try. But the next thing is to stand up. You need to get up. No matter how many times you fall, you need to get up and do it again and try and try and try again. So um, now I, I still have my track, the one track with the with the site, the site tipper that I now use on a full time basis. And I still, you know, run with the buses as well. That side of the business is still going. You will, you, you know, you, you will come across challenges. The, the most important thing is having the courage to get up every morning having the courage to try again one more time each time one more time and just tell yourself that you have to keep going thank you thank you nolita i think you sum up very well you know that if you're an entrepreneur you must be willing to pay the price which means you need to also know that not everything will work out mm -hmm. and also that you know you need to make up deal with the fact that you'll face rejection and deal with failure sometime in the future so you must be willing, uh, you know, to go through uh, your own and uh, create some changes, some extraordinary results. So that's very uh, important. So that question actually came from Pumla. And Pamela says she loves this topic and she wants to join the logistics and transport sector. So I hope that she'll get in touch with, with, with you. So I think for me, for, from Onika, I think someone has commented that uh, you know they are thanking you for the great insights that you've shared which uh, from the corporate side because it actually has sparked a different angle in that is not really Alabama in, in uh, different thinking in her thinking about supply chain technology lessons to learn from e-commerce and ways to to uh, collaborate the way of the way of procuring so Onika I, I, I you know I love the fact that you actually presented this from a practical point of view so so when you look at collaboration, for you, for example, for the inter the small business, what did you see exactly? Maybe just one key point, one takeaway that you saw that worked. Uh, you know, as we talk about collaboration, because we don't understand collaboration, as you are saying, we don't. You raised also that you know the pie is big. There's a lot. There's enough for us to work on. But this is not how we see it. When we see something, when I do it for ourselves, or what, you know, for myself, even if I know I can share with, for example, you know, uh, knowledge or someone else. So how can you? What? What? What can you advise there? Okay. One of the examples. I'm going to make an example with tracking because uh, most people when we're talking logistics they are thinking about tracking so when there was a shortage of trucks we realized that people needed to think to think outside their normal customers so i'll give you an example when we have we had a truck that was in uh, in the eastern cape going to deliver something and somebody else needed something to come back from that side of the country we would then collaborate and say, actually, I have a truck that's picking up or that's dropping off X, Y, Z in this area. We can get that truck to pick up for you and drop off at this point. If you can do, as like take it from KZN or take it from Johannesburg and then take it to Port Elizabeth. So everybody was very, during that week when we were rebuilding from the riots, everybody, we forgot about profits. We just, everybody was just focusing on how can I get my product to my customer, like urgently. And in doing that, we saw that people were getting loads, people were getting exposed to routes that they traditionally would not have ventured into. People were seeing customers that they didn't even know existed in the country. So when we're talking collaboration, we're just talking about, okay, this is my footprint. What is your footprint? Where can I leverage of your footprint? Is there something that I can do in your footprint? And in reverse, you can do something in mine. And then that way we become uh, profitable. That is just one tiny example, but there are plenty. On the warehousing side as well, plenty of examples where warehouses have been destroyed and we needed to reach out to non-traditional uh, solutions for our products. Thank you, Anika. Thank you for that uh, elaborative uh, answer. That's very interesting. I hope we can learn from that. And Lebu, I know you. You know you talk more about um, you know entrepreneurship and women. I know you've also been criticized at some stage when I read one of your posts in terms of <laughs> we. You know, let's stop looking for jobs and let's 
start thinking and being entrepreneurship. I know you've been criticized that you're talking from a point of privilege, but seeing that our economy is sitting at almost 28% of unemployment. And I think for people who have stopped looking for work, we are at 44.4% as of last week. So I'm wondering uh, if we look at our population and look at 44, that is unemployment, including people who are not stop look, looking for employment. What can you say? What do you think when you were criticized for it, when you wrote that article, what was on your mind? Can you just share with us as we are nearing our uh, closing? You know, it's Bongile, it's always um, interesting when people say that um, you're speaking out of privilege um, more than anything else. And I always go back and say, you know, I used to be a professional myself and um, I'm on my fifth year of my business and I started making money on my, um, my fourth and the fifth um, year. Well, that's on my fifth year. And, um, you know, I have fallen and there's no privilege around it. Um, I think for me, it's, it's always part and parcel of understanding the industry. Um, it, it, you know, the statistics do not look good in terms of South Africa and where we are compared relatively to the world in terms of unemployment. Let, let's just sit back. Um, as, 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 and the reason I'm bringing my perspective of where I'm coming from is that I didn't wake up just um, and I said I'm an entrepreneur. I got to go into the industry, I understood supply chain, procurement, all the way to logistics. And um, what has been happening as well was that I had to understand the industry and having understood the industry helped me to understand that when I went into intra entrepreneurship, I went into business at a very late age, um, um, above 30 something when I quit my corporate years in 35 um, and then um, now starting with the business. So no one taught me about business at a very young age. So I'm saying that if we really want to um, alleviate poverty, one of the things that we need to do is start instilling entrepreneurship at a very, very young age. And I say at a very, very young age, from high school, um, getting into tertiary, when a student gets to their third year, and they start thinking of where to work at, they are starting to think what to do at there. We have so many unemployed students right now. And in most cases, these youth do not know where to go to. So imagine if we had some proper program that we integrated with the youth, where we are saying that when you get to a certain year, third year within a specific profession, now I'm talking supply chain, understand end-to-end -end supply chain and where you want to focus on. But let's start building those technical skills so that if you can't find a job, at least be able to start up something. I mean, I remember one of the young um, girls that we have said that, listen, I want to have a warehouse to be able to store the, the clothes and everything else for, 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 for the students. So you already, you see, instilling a mindset like that, thinking small, but larger at the same time. So pipelining needs to happen from the business, business perspective. We need to start very young, very critical around it. Now, let's go now to this unemployment. Look at the landscape of South Africa. Now let's start talking about procurement, the movement, and so forth. We want to alleviate poverty, Bongile. Now, um, I, I love our, our country, South Africa. There's so much corruption, but at the same time, we have so much potential. This, I always say that there is no country has got such a beautiful sense of humor <laughs> like South Africa. And um, we, we are always hoping for the best. Now, let me give you this example. Um, as South Africa, um, you know, over the weekend, it's very interesting you asking me this question because I was saying to someone that, you know what, I'm seated at home with probably, um, let me say, three, like, three iPads um, because of the boards that I sit in. So for each and every board, they will hand you an iPad. What does that mean? Those boards are the government boards, by the way. So if you have to start thinking strategic procurement, what do you do? You need to start thinking how many state-owned entities are in South Africa and how do we, we know that for each and every entity, all the board members requires iPads. So why don't you start looking at the sharing mechanism instead of me having three iPads for the boards in the government? Why don't someone at National Treasury start thinking procuring now economies of scale, then we're saving money for the country. So that money, can you see now, I'm start thinking now on the saving side. And that money could be used for something else that could also create jobs. That's the first thing. The second part, we have prisons in South Africa. All right, having prisons in South Africa, the work that happens, the uniform, the food that's been given into the prisoners, 
it's given to a private company. Why don't we take some of this money now and build some workshop or build whatever it may be. Now we start taking food from the agriculture, then the logistics that is used. You start using the transporters that are locally to South Africa, small ones, get more women in that pipeline. But now from the job creation perspective, what you do, you start creating jobs. You start getting a label that does not have a job out there to be a chef. You get a label that is out there to procure, to consolidate the demand for the prisons in South Africa. So the cooking, the uniforms, you start creating jobs and ensuring that you teach unemployment and unemployed women out there how to do tailoring. So in the uniforms, the linen in the hospitals as well. So I'm trying to think just beyond how we do things in procurement, but also what I'm saying that if you're talking about transportation as well, let's use then these women as already to be part of this process, to be able to move, to enable the warehousing, to enable the transportation as well in the country. If you're doing clearing and forwarding, freight forwarding, we have helped companies establish their clearing and forwarding business. Use those women. So what we have already done now, we created employment by consolidating our scale, using the resources of the winner to be to do um, what is it to um, to have transportation modes in, in you know in still clearing and forwarding if we have to now start moving across the country as well. So as Bongile, it's 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 it can be we, we really have to bring our thought leadership around this employment area, but also let us remember all of us as supply chain professionals, we are enabling this. And part of enabling this is saying that we proudly South African, we are localizing, we have to make sure that we create employment as we know that enterprise and supply development programs are seated with us, supply chain professionals. So how do you ensure, and I'm challenging you as well, um, all the professionals, the procurement colleagues that are here, the logistics colleagues that are here, how do you ensure that now you bring this and you change the landscape, the thinking around how we do things? These economies of scale now start procuring because now we create jobs. When we industrialize and we start looking at supplier development, let's have sustainability and sustainability will create empowered, you know, sustainable organizations that can build the country, it can build the economy. It's stepping stones that we must have. And let me tell you this, as supply chain professionals, uh, I think we, we are privy to understanding to end, the end-to-end -end value chains. And, 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 and if we have that thought leadership, let me tell you colleagues that we will be able to change these thoughts, Wengile. Um, and, and, and yes, Unfortunately, we always, as, as thought leaders, as advocates in the industry, we have to say what we believe is always our thoughts. But the truth is, it's all about building the country. It's not about labor, it's about saying that what can we change? And doesn't mean that everything that we are saying is correct, is the thought and saying that how do we really start changing the way we are doing things in South Africa, in Africa, and now going forward after, which is now what will create more employment for us in Africa as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Lebu. Uh, thank you very much. Just briefly, Lebu, Pumla Mazamisa is asking, uh, how do I, how does he, she get mentoring uh, from your organization as a young business? Just briefly. All right, Pumla, um, we, we have um, ESG programs for youth. Um, if, um, and now we're starting for 100 um, youth um, in, um, what is it, students um, now in, in, in September as well. You can go to our website, awiska, um, www.awiska.org. I'll also put the details of the organizations that if you want mentorship and coaching and part of the dialogues that we are doing and also understand it's not even just once off, we have the dialogues that are really helping entrepreneurs um, in the transport sector. So please jam, I'll put all the details on the chat box um, if you are looking for that information. Um, thank you, Lebo. Uh, Ceci, I think Ceci has raised her hand. There's a question that she wants to ask the panelists. Ceci? Thank you so much, uh, Smongile. And can you all hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can, Ceci. Yes, you can uh, go ahead. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Smongile, to your panelists as well. Uh, what they've shared with us today was, was very inspiring. And, and, and I'm, I'm really thankful as a woman and who aspires as well to, to greater things out there. Nolita, you've touched on something earlier on where you were sharing with us how the COVID has impacted your business and which led to you, you know, having to, to downgrade, you know, um, 
um, ju just for you to meet your end, end needs. And I know that it is not only you, some even multinationals out there are even impacted by, by the COVID. But yet these national shocks, you know, are not necessarily, um, it's not something that we don't know of. It, it, we don't know of, and although there's no one, because it's something that it's, um, comes with when we are least expecting it. I mean, um, the, the point in case that comes to mind is the, is the financial crisis, which came in, 20, in, 20, in 20, 2008, which led to some other businesses as well, you know, being destroyed as a result. So I wanted to ask all the panelists, you know, how, how, how do you suggest that the business gets ready for all these national shops? Because today we're talking about the, the pandemic, uh, uh, COVID uh, pandemic, and in five years time, we might be talking about something else. And, and how do we help our organizations or the, the entrepreneurs, you know, thinking in terms of diversifying their business so they can just sort of, you know, balance when one, when other business, you know, sort of falls or is being is being impacted severely impacted by 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 the by the uh, whatever might be happening um, in that in that particular period the other one is able to survive and pick up the rest of the business so we can stay out there you know in how to how would you advise and now knowing what we know now how do we take care and of these national shocks when they come you know um, to us in the future that's such a strong question. Um, I think what's very important point that you're raising is that we were not prepared. <laughs> uh, we were not prepared as entrepreneurs. We were not prepared as a country. We were not prepared. And when COVID hit us, um, as you know, a lot of companies, they closed down. Um, a lot of people didn't know how to, to respond to, to, to the shock. One of the things that uh, I know some of the uh, uh, entrepreneurs that I um, I'm very, very close to, uh, I'll, I'll make an example. I'm not going to make an example with me because I'm not yet there, but I'll make an example with a friend of mine, uh, Sam Mhaule. Uh, he's the founder of Sky Rule Twist, which is a, 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 a drink, a soft drink. And uh, when COVID started, one of the things that he decided to do was to think outside the box, and he started a um, he started a a brand, a, a sports brand called Kicks. Okay, and um, the, the you know it, it's it's techies, it's it's socks, it's 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 really your full gear of sports brand. And he decided to grow the brand, and he decided to 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 grow that and. And when he did that, what I was very impressed with was that everyone wears techies. We know that we, we all do need techies. And, um, you know, it was something that was totally different from the soft drinks that we knew him to do, you know, when he started this, this, this techie um, um, side of things. And, and it worked out for him because when the sales went down on, you know, a lot of people were not consuming um, a lot of drinks, um, you know, because we were home, uh, we, we didn't buy from the cans, we would buy two liters instead of the cans. So, you know, when the production was down on that side, what he decided to do, he started to, 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 to manufacture these techies and the production went up on that side. And that gave him multiple streams of income. Um, on my side, I was impacted on both sides because, yes, the one side of the business is tracking, the second side of the business is going to transport. So when the, 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 the company shut down, both my businesses just went down because the kids were not going to school and obviously the track were not on the road. And it's because of the specialized side of the tracking that I was doing. So I had to look at what can I do with the with the tanker and obviously food was moving um uh food was moving so I sold the tanker I I, I kept the, the 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 tipper so food was moving so I started to transport soya instead of the industrial waste that was there yeah on the soya side it wasn't as big as obviously the the industrial waste or the 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 chrome or the manganese that I was transporting but it was something that I could still just keep moving and keep going with it. So sometimes, yes, we are challenged that as entrepreneurs, you're focusing on one thing, but when you start to um, 
you know, with the pandemic, with the riots that were happening uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago, last month, actually, it, it hit hard, especially on the trucking, because the trucks, again, we had to stop. The schools, again, we couldn't transport the kids. But at the same time, it makes you to think outside the box to say, what can you do outside of transport? And I think that's where I'm at at the moment. What can I do outside of transport? I know transport, but what can I do outside of transport? It's a good question for me, but thank you so much. Thank you, Nolita. Um, I think, thank you to that. I think uh, we will have to, uh, I will have to quickly wrap up. And as I leave, I think you panelists, I know you're supposed to say maybe some uh, within 30 seconds or so, but I'll just say and pose this question that um, in our world of entrepreneurship, you know, we believe that an idea, we know that an idea is only the first step to start a long road. That is not usually easy. So a lot of times it is believed that having this concept, for example, and uh, some savings, uh, in our bank accounts, it's enough to start a business. But we are married to that plan, for example, as startups, and uh, with a view to turning our businesses into large multi-million companies. But then we are not taught a little sad, for example, about the human effort that is required and the personal work tools that are necessary to actually start and resist and be resilient in this process. So I, I will leave that question out there to think about. And the panelists, we know that we will engage further to say, how do we help? Because we know the states are very, you know, they're not promising in our country in terms of what exactly, what is happening. We've seen the DTI, all startups, I think 80 to 90% of startups fail within the first three years. And we see, um, I think every year, we just see, uh, you know, companies, small businesses starting from level one, but they're not migrating. So can we just look at that? We will have a session. I think Manzi Africa is holding that um, uh, uh, SMME summit in the next month. So we'll be exploring particularly that aspect in terms of how do we migrate a small business and, and entrepreneurship into growing our businesses. And the question that Ceci has asked as well, how do we actually buffer or try to actually have those tools to say, how do we uh, prepare ourselves for uh, disasters. Thank you, Pumzil. I'll hand back to you. Wow, what a uh, insightful panel. Um, you know, I'm a practical, practical thinker. So whenever I engage in these types of panels, I always appreciate when we are, we can bring knowledge and, and theory and then bring it all together to talk to the practicalities that the country is, is really facing at whatever level, whether you're at a corporate level, entrepreneurship level. And you know, the, the panelists today have demonstrated, demonstrated that so, so, so profoundly. So thank you very much for, 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 for that. Um, we will um, move over to the next panel because we are running behind schedule. So we 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 are we are truly really just rushing through, um, but we also don't want to be rushing through because we really want to absorb and get all, all the, the knowledge um, and, and um, the, the thought uh, provoking um, strategies and, and et cetera from, from the panelists. So thank you very much um, for that, um, uh, ladies. Our next panel uh, will be um, really talking about again, entrepreneurship, but this time around, we're taking a, a little slight different lens. Um, the ladies in the panel will be talking about um, consulting in the professional spaces um, as, as supply chain or procurement management consultants. Um, Genevieve will help us moderate this panel. Uh, let's see um, the nuggets that the ladies have in store for us. Over to you, 